Um, I know there's a lot of stories about quant firms pumping out eight figure bonuses and stuff like that. And it definitely does exist, but I'd say at the five year mark, you're probably an experienced trader, but not a senior one. Mm -hmm. So definitely mid six figures, we're talking $500,000, three to $700,000 is a very safe bet. So what does a quant trader interview look like? Well, in this video, you guys are in for a treat because I invited back the quant trader in this video here to go into more detail about the interview process. Hi, I'm Worthen. I'm a quant trader. And today we're going to go over uh, some of the basic stuff for quant trader interviews. Uh, we're going to go over the different rounds, some specifics and advice for each round, and then some of the materials that helped me prepare. Uh, so a quant trader is any type of trader that uses basically quantitative analysis, data science, some sort of data-driven model to influence their decisions. It doesn't mean that you're an algorithmic trader necessarily, or uh, it doesn't mean that you're using a bot to trade for you. All it means is that you're using some sort of model to help you make decisions. And as you can probably tell, that can mean a lot of different things depending on where you go. Uh, so quant traders work at a variety of places. Uh, some of them, the big ones you've heard are like at banks where they're gonna be more on the research side or at hedge funds where they're gonna be making models um, and employing advanced strategies, advanced institutional strategies or at trading firms. And trading firms can be either proprietary trading firms, which are very similar to hedge funds or they can be market making firms, which are um, using quantitative strategies to make different markets and find arbitrage or alpha or profit, if you would say. So the interview process is usually two to four rounds, beginning with an OA and then going to two or yeah, usually one or two online or, you know, Zoom, Skype or through the phone rounds, uh, followed by a final round where you're going to get many of the questions you saw before, the mental math, the logic, the probably the brain teasers, but with some in-person interviews you know, about behaviorals, uh, and usually some sort of mock trading. So the first round uh, is, like I said, gonna be an online assessment. Uh, most of the time uh, in this round, you're gonna get the same as what you'd see in an engineering place, very standardized speed-based uh, exam, basically that's testing how quick you can think. And it's basically just trying to eliminate people who they don't wanna consider for the in-person round. So here you're gonna get a lot of mental math, uh, just as many as you can answer in a certain period of time, probability and combinatorics. Uh, yeah, that's a math question. You might get two digit by two digit, like 23 times 18. Fast logic, so a fast logic question is probably gonna be something with combinatorics or probability. Uh, the easiest side would be like, given five tosses, what are the odds you get? X heads and Y tails. So the second and the third round are going to be in-person versions of what you got in the first round, which means that they're going to ask you things that are more in-depth, questions that involve multiple stages, so card questions where the situation changes on each round, or uh, dice problems where we add dice or take dice away, and you have to create an EV or expected value. Alternatively, they might give you some more mental math on the spot, just both as a way to you know, check that you can actually do the mental math and to see how you work, work under pressure. Yeah, so the final round interview in terms of mathematical rigor is probably very, very similar to the other two uh, that came before it. So the second and the third round, some firms will increase in difficulty, some will not. Um, it shouldn't be too different. If you were able to pass the math in the first couple, you should be okay, assuming you, you know, knew and didn't just memorize. Uh, the specific questions but the two things that stand out are the behavioral and the trading simulation or the mock trading that people will have you do uh, the behavioral is like the behavioral at most other firms uh, it'll you know change a little bit what they talk about based off of your background so if you're a finance major you have a finance background they might talk to you a little bit about that and they might ask you some questions that normally you wouldn't get asked if you were you know a humanities background or something like that uh, but the one to focus on really is the mock trading which is where you and uh, other interviewees will go into a room and make markets basically against each other which is where you decide what you'd be willing to buy or sell a specific thing that you're trying to make a market on. Let's do an example of a trading simulation. Okay, so like, let's say you're making a market on the people in the room that you're interviewing with. And for some reason, you think the average height is probably like 5'8 or something like that. Um, so what you would do is you would give a market, for example, like 5'6 at 5'10 or, you know, 5'5 five, five at 5'10 of uh, some market where you have uh, what they call edge or profit on both sides of your 
expected value or your fair value. If I think it's 5.8, the range is like, oh, I think it's between like 5.7 and 5.9. Yeah. And then what, uh, what should I do? 5.7 and 5.9. Mm -hmm. So really you wouldn't want to be trading until you can buy or sell outside that range, right? So if you can buy below 5.7 or you can sell above 5.9, then that's a fair trade for you. So I want to buy below 5.7. Yeah. And I want to, oh, because it's lower, right? So I want yeah. to buy below so, five seven, and I want to sell above 5.8. Yeah. For you, if you think it's, your, it's six foot and your range, for example, is like 5.8 until 6.3, then you should want to buy everything that's under 5.8. And then you would yeah. want to sell everything that's under, that's over cool. so, Yeah, so often the way you're thinking about it is not that you have this large range of outcomes that you think it's definitely in there, right? Optimally, you have an outcome that you think is very close to. So like having a one inch wide range is much better than having a six inch wide range because the range you can trade is smaller. So you innately think you have more edge because you believe your information is better. But you also need to account for variance. So like if we walk into this room and there's everybody's either five foot or they're playing on a basketball team, then you're going to have to have a lot of variance. And your answer will might very well have to be I won't trade anything between 5.8 and 6.2. So the way you win is you're supposed to make trades that are informed. I guess height is something that they could use. Something else would be like the amount of people that you would expect in, I don't know, there's a lot of trading firms in Chicago. So the amount of people you'd expect to live in Chicago. Um, and then people will create their firm markets and they will encourage you to trade by giving information that will drive markets one way or the other. Uh, and ultimately it's just about the way you think and most importantly, being the first person, if you can be, to trade. So you are rewarded for taking initiative. When you're trading at one of these firms, most of the time the firms giving these interviews are going to be testament of market making style. And in market making, you never have 100% of the information. So your job is to take educated bets, essentially, or educated trades and put on positions that you think will be profitable. So if you're too scared to trade, you're telling the interviewees that you essentially don't want to market make. So you don't want to be in that role. So you really need to be trading. Yeah, so uh, the first one that most people start prepping for is the mental math section. Uh, and for me, I just use ZetaMac or ZetaMac, uh, which is an online mental math tool website that you can use. It's the best where you can get in two minutes. And it was really helpful just to get used to that sort of question. A lot of them are going to be online mental math questions. So uh, getting ready for that and getting ready to, you know, typing, be typing your answers into a computer is what was really important for me. And just by the way, Worthen's very, very good at set Mac. His top score right now is, I believe, 74? 75. 75. So try it out yourself and see you can beat it. I think my, my score last time the highest I've ever gotten, I think, was like 48. So that's a challenge for you guys. So for to prep for logic and probability, I used Glassdoor as well as the book Heard on the Street uh, by Timothy Falconcrack. Honestly, if you've taken a probability or combinatorics class, you will have covered 95% at least of what you need to know for the interview process. There's two parts to Glassdoor. One of them is an advantage and one of them is a pretty big disadvantage. Um, the advantage is that a lot of the questions come from people who interviewed very recently and they're very company specific. So the issue with using the book is that even though it has a wide, a wide berth of questions, it doesn't tell you which one is for which company. And you do get some company specific questions, ones that specific companies will ask you that other ones will not at all. Uh, and that's what Glassdoor is really useful for because you'll get to see what those interviews are like and if they have some very special math question or special probability, or I've even seen like logarithm question, logarithm estimation questions that they give you, you're gonna be prepared for those because you can learn that skill for that interview. Uh, the downside of Glassdoor is I would say maybe two in 10, three in 10 questions don't have an answer or don't have an answer you can verify without doing the problem yourself. And for some people, if they aren't as confident in their math abilities and don't trust themselves to be able to verify the question, that's a really big downfall because they're not going to have an answer for it. And they're going to have to throw out 20 to 30% of their question. As you get into the smaller firms, the ones that don't have the big brand names, you're going to have less question availability. Um, those firms tend to have more specialized interviews. So it's also tougher to prepare. They're going to ask for different things, but those I wouldn't worry too much about preparing for the, in the, in those cases, preparing for the generalized interview will do you pretty well in most cases. So to prepare for the final round, 
If you've prepared correctly for the previous ones, you are going to be fine on the math front. I would be fairly sure of that going to the final round. The one thing that makes a difference is in that uh, trading game or in any sort of interaction game that they might come up with you to be really confident. And preparing for that is going to be difficult, more difficult for some people than others. I know there are certain some clubs, the finance club or the trading club at a, a lot of colleges will have these mock events for you to practice. But if you don't have that resource, I would say try to either practice with a group of people that are interested or at absolute worst, just prepare yourself to make fair markets on different things and be willing to uh, go out there and try to trade them when you're given the chance in the game. So we went over um, the different rounds of the interview process, the different resources that I use to prepare for each of those processes and what each of the rounds would look like, as well as some advice for each of the rounds when you get there.